Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 35 years we have invited voices of conscience to explore the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and moderator of the forum. Tonight's guest speaker, Patrick Kennedy, will be introduced by his good friend and by our esteemed former U.S. Congressman Jim Ramstead, who represented Minnesota's 3rd District from 1991 to 2009. Mr. Ramstead, we're honored to have you here with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. Our speaker for this evening has been called the nation's leading advocate for mental health and addiction policy and research. The New York Times called him the public face of addiction in America. Were President Kennedy, Patrick's uncle, alive today, and were he to write a sequel to his celebrated award-winning book, Profiles in Courage, there's no doubt in my mind that his nephew, Patrick Kennedy, would occupy a full chapter in that book. <laughs> Patrick's story is also about hope and recovery, as you will hear momentarily. When our beloved colleague and dear friend, Paul Wellstone, perished in that horrendous plane crash, Paul had started the movement for legislation providing parity for mental illness and addiction. And when Paul perished, I was proud to join Senator Kennedy and Patrick Kennedy, as I did Senator Wellstone, in sponsoring landmark mental health and addiction parity legislation, which finally, finally was signed into law by President George W. Bush in 2008. But to me, the speaker for this evening is more than just a former colleague. He's the little, little brother I never had. Play, I'm very pleased to introduce to the Westminster Town Hall Forum a true profile in courage, Congressman Patrick Kennedy. Thank you very much, Jim. You, you read those cards just as I had written them down. <laughs> I am blessed, blessed to have Jim Ramstead in my life. And you are blessed to have him as your congressman. And this nation's been blessed to have his leadership on this issue of coverage for addiction, because keep in mind, the bill that Jim mentioned is called the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. And Paul Wellstone believed in them both being in the final bill. But it was Jim's effort in the House to really make that a reality. And he was out there uh, sowing the fields for this bill before I was. But of course, it's all about who gets the credit. And so when it came to me getting as much of the credit that was properly due, Jim, I took every advantage of that opportunity. <laughs> <clears throat> and we'll barely mention his name in passing whenever I have a chance. The, the truth is that I would never have been able to, uh, to, to work on this bill had it not been for his leadership. We worked on it within the House conference, uh, but uh, it took the Democratic uh, majority for us to ultimately get the bill passed. Um, and, and as Jim mentioned, this was signed into law by a Republican president. And just so anyone doesn't get any uh, apprehensions about any political speech, it took Democrats and Republicans to pass this bill because guess what? Mental illness and addiction affects both Democrats and Republicans equally. <laughs> so
So uh, I, I, I couldn't believe when they said there would be a big audience at the Westminster Town Hall, how big it was going to be. But I have to say, I haven't seen this many people in one room since I last ate dinner over at my Aunt Ethel's house. <laughs> uh, usually I get introduced and they talk about how uh, I was elected to the State House in Rhode Island at the age of 21. And then how uh, I went on and was elected as the youngest member of the Congress at age 27. And then how I was elected by my colleagues at the age of 31 to be the fourth highest ranking Democrat in the House. And then I am introduced and everyone thinks that's a great thing, except I have to come up and put the caveat in there and I say, I'm sure it had nothing to do with my last name being Kennedy, <laughs> whatsoever. Um, so I am honored to, to be in this place. It's uh, um, particularly for me, knowing that I spent a good deal of my time in Congress working for Minnesotans. <clears throat> If you can believe it, I, I lived right next door to Paul Wellstone. We both lived in this condominium called, complex called Justice Court. <laughs> I mean, how much better does it get? Paul Wellstone in Justice Court. It's perfect. And, I, and, I, and he and I would walk uh, to work or walk back at night. And, uh, and then I got to work with Jim Ramstead. And then when it came time for me to go to treatment, where do I go but Minnesota for treatment? <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, so we'll, we'll do, uh, jump into questions. Um, I think that'll be the most interactive and allow all of our time to go fast. But I'll just start by saying uh, I left Congress uh, in 2011, and I didn't know what I was going to do with myself, so I uh, figured that uh, no one was returning my calls, because Jim knows this, when you're a former member of Congress, you fall off the face of the earth. And, um, but I knew this Kennedy thing had gotten me really far in politics, and it, <laughs> it still worked occasionally. And I knew that the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy's uh, New Frontier was fast approaching as I was leaving Congress. And so I thought, well, maybe I can repurpose some of John F. Kennedy's 50ths and, you know, keep this political life that I had alive. So I figured I'd call my cousin Caroline. I said, Caroline, I've got a great idea to celebrate your father's 50th anniversary because I looked in the history books and you know they called your father's administration the new frontier. And I said, I was just in a meeting with some top neuroscientists and they told me that the brain is the last medical frontier. And so Caroline, I think we ought to have an event and repurpose your father's mantle about the next frontier, which is brain science. And Caroline said, Patrick, I love your enthusiasm for the brain. I just <laughs> so excited. You're so passionate about the brain. She said, but we've already got the president coming and the speaker in both houses, and they're going to honor daddy and his legacy. And I'm like, oh, well, I figured it was a try. And Caroline said, don't worry, you can have May 25th. I'll give you Daddy's library. And, I'm, and at that point, I didn't want to ask her what May 25th was, so I had to Google it and found out that May 25th was when uh, President Kennedy said that we would go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. But he went on and said we would return a man safely uh, from the moon. So I said to Caroline, that'll work for me. I'll, I'll, I'll take the moonshot anniversary. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, 
And so I invited all of the NIH directors. By the way, there's over a dozen separate NIH directors that study one organ of the body. The National Institutes for Childhood and Human Development studies early developmental disabilities, National Institutes on Neurological Disorders, National Institutes on Alcoholism, National Institutes on Mental Health, National Institutes on Aging. I mean, I could keep going. You got the point. All of them study the same organ. So I had the bright idea, maybe I could get them to all work together. So I brought them all in, and I ran the tape of John F. Kennedy saying that we don't do these things because they're easy, we do them because they're hard. That's how he used to say it. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, I, so I saw them all in the room, and I said, you know what? Um, I am in a room full of modern-day astronauts because, you see, my uncle took us to outer space, but the big challenge for our generation is to start a new race, a race to inner space, and you all are the astronauts that are going to take us there. And all of a sudden, uh, Tim, you didn't have to ask people to put their phones down. They, they put them down after I said that they were all astronauts. They, they put their iPads down. They actually looked up and they smiled. <laughs> and I said, furthermore, we've got to put an American flag on all of you because what you're doing is fundamental to our national security as a nation. Because there's nothing that's going to make more of a difference to every aspect of our society than the work that you're doing to unlock the mysteries of the mind, to understand how this precious organ, which makes this country so great because of the creativity and the personality, ingenuity of our people, all wrapped up in there, the fact they've got brains that are always creating the new and the best in the world, that that is our greatest natural resources, and you're helping to figure out how to maintain it and unlock its mysteries. And I will tell you, I have to t give myself a little credit here. I was mobbed by these neuroscientists afterwards. And Tom Insel came running over to me and said, Patrick, I've never been called an astronaut before, but I love it. I love it. <laughs> and um, so then Steve Hyman, the former NIMH director, came over. He was provost at Harvard, head of the MIT Broad Center. You don't have to know what that means, except that it's a really big deal. And he said, Patrick, I want to do the 10-year race to inner space for you. And I'll call all my former NIH colleagues and get them to participate. And I said, you're on. And we went on from there, and we created what was called One Mind. One Mind for Brain Research. So instead of us researching all the separate diagnoses, we research all the mechanisms from the genome to the metabolome to the proteome, to the connectome, to the phenome. Believe it or not, there are that many layers of science that need to be done. And then they all have to be integrated. So I said, how do we do this? And I asked my friend Dan Golden, who ran NASA. And he said, you know what? The race to inner space is just like the race to outer space. We need supercomputing capability, and we need to integrate all the levels of science in what's called systems analysis. And I said, I don't know what that means. He said, you don't have to worry about it. It just means that all the science has to talk to all the rest of the science. I said, okay, I got it. You know, we need to put a NASA for the race. Yes, that's what we have to do. So, so we got that uh, going. We hired a four-star general who ran operations in Iraq to be our CEO. Why? Because there's so many turf battles in research that no one wants to share the science, even though that science can help unlock the mysteries of another diagnosis. And if, I, if you were surprised to hear, if I were to ask you, where was most of the foundational research on Alzheimer's discovered? In the National Institutes on Aging, the National Institutes on Neurological Disorders, or the National Institutes on Children? You'd be right if you, if you guessed children. 
and the National Institutes on Children is named the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute on Childhood and Human Development, because she got her brother to start that. Why? Because of my Aunt Rosemary. Why? Because my Aunt Rosemary and my Aunt Eunice wanted to understand the developmental uh, disability that she suffered and help prevent it. And it was that institute that under understood that the symptoms of Down syndrome was dementia, because people with Down syndrome have much higher dementia than most any other population. How could my Aunt Eunice have known, when she got that institute started 50 years ago, that her late husband, my Uncle Sarge Shriver, died of Alzheimer's? that all five of my Shriver cousins are now worried about having Alzheimer's, but that we're closer to unlocking the mysteries of Alzheimer's. Why? Because 50 years ago, we started researching dementia for people with Down syndrome before anyone even knew what Alzheimer's was. Now, that just should give you chills, that Eunice started it to help understand developmental disabilities and the research that came from that is helping to unlock the door to the disease that all of her five children are worried about succumbing to. That illustrates my point that all of this science has to be seen in a holistic way. So I figured this really works, so what's the next 50th JFK anniversary that's coming up I can take advantage of? So now that we've, worked, we've brought all this fragmented neuroscience together, how are we going to bring the fragmented mental health field together? So wouldn't you know that the last bill that John F. Kennedy signed into law was called the Community Mental Health Act, signed into law shortly before he was assassinated. And at the signing ceremony, he said, the mentally ill need no longer be alien to our affections or beyond the help of our communities. Now, if President Obama or any candidate wanted to encapsulate in one sentence what the challenge before this nation is in tackling all issues related to mental illness and addiction, they could use that quote and have it capture the whole essence of the challenge that this country faces in all its areas. Hear it again, the mentally ill need no longer be alien to our affections. Now, isn't it the truth that in all things mental illness, all things addiction, the people suffering from those illnesses are alien to our affections as a society? That's why we're in such desperate shape as a country in terms of dealing with these epidemics. Epidemic and no one wants to deal with it because the people suffering from these illnesses are alien to our affections. But President Kennedy didn't say, or beyond the help of our psychiatric hospitals. He didn't say, beyond the help of our psychologists or our psychiatrists. He said, beyond the help of our communities. And that, my friends, is the answer for this country if we want to understand how we're going to address this challenge. Because this is no longer that someone else's business. It's no longer the business of the mental health system. It's no longer the business of the health care system or the criminal justice system or you name it. It's all of our challenge. And when John F. Kennedy said, beyond the help of our communities, he was illustrating what the answer to this is, and that is that it's going to take all of us to be part of the solution. So we had kicked off another uh, organization. I named it the Kennedy Forum. And uh, the, the whole mission of the Kennedy Forum is to advocate for the civil rights of people with these illnesses. Because before he signed this into law, he gave another famous speech that was perhaps one of the most famous speeches of his whole administration. And when he talked about the moral challenge of his time, which was civil rights, 
and he said, who amongst us would be willing to trade the color of their skin and be content with those who counsel patience and delay? And if you hear anything about where we are with those suffering from mental illness or addiction today, everyone's saying, well, let's wait. Oh, maybe we can get to this next year. Oh, that's a, yes, I know it's an injustice. So many people are homeless. Oh, I know our emergency rooms are clogged with people without getting the proper care because their mental illnesses aren't treated. Oh, I know that there's an epidemic of addiction. Oh, I know there's an epidemic of suicide. Oh, I know that our veterans are returning home and dying at record rates at their own hands. But oh, we'll wait till later to get to that problem. In fact, it won't even come up in any one of the president's State of the Union addresses. We'll deal with that later on. And then understand what it was like in 1963 when all of President Kennedy's advisors were telling him, don't push civil rights now. We'll get to civil rights. Don't rush us. You may, you may um, hurt your chances if you push too hard on this. And I am so proud that my uncle was the first president to go on national television and speak about this as a moral issue in the way that he so powerfully did. Who amongst us? would be willing to trade the color of their skin and be content with those who counsel patience and delay. Because it may not be you, but try walking in the shoes of someone who's treated as a second-class citizen simply because of the color of their skin. And then say to yourself, oh, it must be okay to wait a little longer for them to get the justice that they are guaranteed under the Constitution but denied by current law. And I think, my friends, that is the challenge for those with suffering from mental illness and addiction today because they are discriminated against simply because their illness is in their brain as opposed to another organ of their body. It's that basic. It's that simple. They get second standard care. They don't get the reimbursement. And if it weren't for the legislation that Jim and I worked on together, they'd still be paying higher co-pays, higher deductibles, higher premiums, and have lower lifetime caps on their coverage. <clears throat> but thanks to the law that we passed, all of those are prohibited. And then you think back in 1964, because civil rights was passed, and we all know it was just the beginning. You needed the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing, and the Fair Employment all to come along. And, and what I am saying to all of you is in this fight for equality for those suffering from these illnesses, we have to take those next steps just as they did in the Civil Rights Movement. So as you can tell, I haven't said a word about everything you've come here to talk to me about tonight. <laughs> I've subjected you to all this policy stuff without giving you the guts and glory of my story of addiction and what it's like being a Kennedy. <laughs> and I, come on, that's really what it's all about. Just, <laughs> just, just come on, give me the People, People that magazine version. I mean, <clears throat> you know, and, but I, I understood that it would sell a lot of books that that my average garden variety alcoholism and addiction story, where I was humiliated on a constant basis and yet kept doing things that put me in that same spot over and over and over again. I'm a garden variety alcoholic and addict. But I knew that if I told my story about how I, you know, got oxycotton I was already on it but I got some more on Air Force One because I put my hand in the uh, napkin dispenser and because I was so inebriated when I pulled my hand out took the top of my finger off and I got it all uh, addressed on Air Force One they broke out the surgical tables and they stitched me up and I had the President of the United States Bill Clinton looking over me going that, that's probably kind of cool that's kind of cool <clears throat> how did they do that 
<laughs> and, and then I had the, the, the doctor just give me more Oxycontin to my joy, even though that was the reason I had gotten my finger stuck in the napkin bin. I mean, these are great stories. <laughs> you know, that's, the people will be interested in reading this stuff. <clears throat> so I put a little bit of that in there. And then, of course, I told the worst secrets uh, around. And that was that both of my parents suffered from alcoholism and mental illness. And there has been a brouhaha about it as if, like, I made some great reveal. <clears throat> uh, when you basically could go to any bookstore in America or library and find legions of books um, on those subjects in more graphic detail than I could ever tell. So why was it so hard for me to, to do this book? It was so hard for me because it's just as hard for every other American to tell the story about their family who has alcoholism and addiction and mental illness in it because we don't talk about these things. And that is the common struggle because all of us have different DSM diagnoses. And, you know, that's not the common struggle because all of us can say, oh, well, I'm not like that. Or, you know, I'm an alcoholic, not an addict. Or I'm mentally ill, not an addict. Or I'm, I'm an addict. I'm certainly not, you know, mentally ill. I mean, that's literally how we talk as consumers. We just think, you know, <clears throat> it's not me. That person's, you know, I'm not that bad. <clears throat> when we're all in the same boat, and that is our brains aren't working very well. And just like every other organ of the body, guess what works? Early intervention. And everyone's like wondering, what are we gonna do in this country? We got so much tragedy and the well, mental health doesn't work. And you know, they, I just, my, the story I know, my frame of reference says that they never get better. Of course they never get better. By the time you get them into treatment, they're in stage four addiction. They're in stage four mental illness. You give the average stage four cancer patient or diabetic or whatever, the same starting line as you would give everybody with addiction and mental illness when they go into treatment. And I guarantee you, we might even pull out ahead in terms of success rates. But isn't it a fact that even to this day, we don't begin treating people with mental illness and addiction until their illness has progressed to such a point that it is hard to unravel how your brain has already become pathologized because of the inattention by our medical system and the inattention by our society towards dealing with this issue in a way that we would in every other instance of medical care. So what is, I'll turn it over to questions soon. So what is it that Jim's and my bill does? And by the way, the bill named for Paul Wellstone, that was a battle in itself. If you read the book, you'll read about how we only wanted to name it after Paul if it was comprehensive because we knew Paul wouldn't want his name on anything but something that was real. And, uh, and we are all blessed. Paul Wellstone, let's give a great round of applause to Paul. <laughs> so that bill, I hope I get it right, Paul, okay? It says, whether you're inpatient, in-network, or outpatient, in-network, or inpatient, out-of-network, or outpatient, out-of-network, <laughs> or you need emergency room care or pharmacy benefits, if you provide it to the stroke victim, if you provide it for the cancer patient, if you provide it for the diabetic or the asthmatic, 
by law. You need to provide it for the person suffering from a brain illness, and it needs to be equivalent or analogous care, meaning you've got to provide the same primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of care that you would provide those other patients for the other medical challenges. Can you hear me, United Healthcare? <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> so, by the way, United is just, they're all in the same bunch, you know, because Anthem Blue Cross, you saw that 60 Minutes denied story last year about them. You've got every one of the carriers have already um, serious violations or um, being leveled against them on parity. And now in Washington, they're all trying to merge. You've got Anthem uh, buying Cigna, and you've got Aetna buying Humana. Both of those deals are in the $50 billion range. And do you think anyone is knocking on the Department of Justice's door and saying, before you approve that merger, maybe they ought to follow a federal law that guarantees equal coverage for people with mental illness and addiction given the, the incidence and the epidemic of those illnesses and the track record of all of these insurers? I'm sorry to say to you, no one's knocking on their door to do that. Because what Jim and I found is that the advocacy in this space is next to nothing. And God bless NAMI, and they do a fantastic, and Mental Health America, we never would have done our parity hearings without them. <clears throat> but you talked to Paul Gianfrido, head of Mental Health America. Um, you, you ask any of the uh, people in, in mental health advocacy, they'll all admit to you that it is absolutely woefully underfunded in terms of advocacy compared to every other major issue in Washington, D.C., which has these big buildings and gleaming glass and great lobbyists that are, are always walking on the hill, knocking on, you know, administration and members of Congress. We don't have it. And why don't we have it? Because the millions of people suffering from these illnesses either cannot advocate for themselves or they're all anonymous. And what happens is, guess what? Politicians take a look around. If they don't see any votes, it doesn't get their attention. And uh, you know, that's just a, a simple political reality at a time where we've got those dying of addiction far surpassing those dying of motor vehicle accidents. And you know how much we do in this country to try to make sure your car is safe. And we've got suicide claiming in the order of 42,000 a year, and we know it's an undercount. And veterans are dying at their own hands at record rates, 22 to 23 a day. But no, we can't bother to put the same political pressure on the insurance industry and on government that cancer advocates would put on them. Because if this were being done to cancer, we wouldn't be able to get, it, get even close to the Capitol. People would be up there making more rallies every day, you know, making the biggest rally look like child's play. But because these are illnesses of shame, we can't get the needed political advocacy to really drive this bill named in Paul's memory, drive it home. So that's what I hope comes from tonight. In the question and answer, I'm happy to give you some uh, scintillating details of my addiction and uh, how it played out in America's, one of America's most famous political storied families. But I hope uh, after all that's said and done, if you get the book, you'll see I've got a whole roadmap for public policy on how we're gonna audit insurance companies, measure non-quantitative treatment limits. If you don't know what that is, it's okay. Just know that's how they deny your son or daughter or mother or father or sister or brother care 
to another level of mental health care addiction treatment. It's called utilization management, medical necessity determinations, and that is otherwise known as non-quantitative treatment limits. And you can know why they get away with it because that seems esoteric, but in fact, that's the difference between your loved one getting the care they need or getting denied and kicked out of detox. That's the difference. So we need to be sharp on these things, and I put in a uh, real guide in the back of the book. Um, again, once you're done reading the very really interesting story <laughs> of my addiction as a member of Congress. Uh, so, uh, Tim, I know I've talked over, way over, but you were supposed to come and get me. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick Kennedy. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker tonight is Patrick Kennedy, who served in the U.S. House of Representatives for 16 years, where he co-sponsored the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of 2008. He is the author of the new book, A Common Struggle. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, let me extend a special thank you to the co-sponsors of this forum, the Westminster Counseling Center and the online news source, MinPost. For information about these organizations, visit their websites at westminstercounseling.org and minpost.org. I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us at Westminster Church for our next forum on Thursday, October 29th at noon, when Jennifer Lawless will speak on the topic, Running From Office, Why Young Americans Are Turned Off to Politics. And now, Mr. Kennedy, if you'll return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. I remember when I was young, and we used to use the phrase, the C word in reference to cancer yeah. because there was such stigma and shame attached, attached to cancer. Somehow we got over that as a nation and look what's happened in terms of treatment for cancer. How do we get over that stigma and how have you personally done that in your own life with mental illness and addiction? So the most recent analog to this is HIV AIDS. Uh, many people with HIV did not want to self-identify and just like with mental illness and addiction, their illness would progress because they wouldn't get the medical care they needed because they didn't want anyone to know. And more of them died as a result of the shame than anything else. And I think that's also true for these illnesses. Shame is the biggest killer. Um, so that's why the common struggle is the silence around these subjects. So, uh, I am the sponsor of Parity, but I need treatment. So what do I do? I check myself into Mayo um, at Christmas time because I figure no one will know because it's during Christmas time. They'll think I'm out skiing with my family or down on the beach somewhere in Florida. They won't know that I'm out in Rochester, Minnesota, so cold that you cannot believe it. <laughs> in the middle of December, what is he thinking? So I would go, and I, when I went in there, I said to the doctors, I said, uh, now you got to detox me from opiates here. And they said, no, no, Congressman, the normal course of treatment is you got to go down to the Generos building. And I said, Jesus, isn't that where the, the crazy people, I mean, come on. I mean, this is like the, and the mentally ill, they're down there, right? The addicts, they're down there. I can't go down there. Don't you know who I am? Uh, you know, I'm the sponsor of parody. They'll uh, it'll ruin my credibility if they know that I'm, I'm like that hair club for men guy. Like, not only <laughs> am I the sponsor of the law, but I'm also a consumer of mental health and addiction treatment. <laughs> and uh, so they said, okay, if you insist. So they kept me in St. Elizabeth. They detoxed me. I got out of there. I'm like, 
brand new. And of course, you know, I couldn't sleep. And I uh, thought Ambien's not bad. I started taking Ambien. Well, you know, opiates were rough. I can drink now and again. I mean, that's not a problem. At least it's not Oxycontin anymore. And so this was my thinking. It's the delusional thinking that many people who are in recovery uh, remember, uh, which took them a long way down the road before they were ever able to turn their corner. So that was true for me. So five months after that, I uh, got into a car accident, um, a DWI, and uh, you know, it's just indicative of the fact that I thought I was well, but I wasn't well because I didn't have the insight about my illness. Um, so stigma, to your question, um, was part of the problem because you know I was so afraid of what people would think that I never had the time to actually get the treatment that I needed. And that's one of the big problems today. We have a parity law in the books. I grant you it's not in full effect because it's not being paid for and the system's not there. But the idea is it will change if we demand this treatment. But we have to first ask for it. And the big impediment to that is the shame around these illnesses. We have lots of questions from our audience here at the Westminster Town Hall Forum about guns and gun violence and mental illness. Would you care to talk about that? So my family is a, a victim of gun violence, obviously. And uh, I've seen how it affects not just the person who's killed, of course, and, the death of my uncles, but um, the profound effect that it had on all of their children and on my dad and my mom, my whole family was, uh, uh, you know, blown apart by that. And it was a mur there were murders, violent murders. So I, uh, my heart goes out to all those families who are going through this, who are going to live with this for the rest of their lives. It'll cross our headlines. You know, we'll go on to the next tragedy, but every single one of those families and every single one of the families who, who lose a loved one tonight in many places in America due to gun violence, they're going to live with this the rest of their lives. The, the impact is well beyond the total um, numerical number of deaths due to guns every year. It is the magnified because of every single family member and loved one that those people who died um, affected. So all I would say is um, we definitely need to address guns. I, I uh, wrote the seven day waiting period in Rhode Island and we added a background check for police chiefs that was not subject to the BCI check. In order to, for it to be a BCI check, you have to have a felony. Most police officers know which homes they're, they're go sending cars out to on a regular basis. And many times those are late nights and domestic violence, none of which gets, uh, all of which gets pleaded down. So it never ends up as a felony. And so my point is, is that we need a much thorough background check than what we have. We did it in Rhode Island. I know it can be done because we did it. Um, and we need a much better mental health system. <clears throat> So these things are not mutually exclusive. So there should be something that passes, because even if you can't get support for my position on safer gun laws, at least we should be able to get better mental health system in place, and that should not be held hostage for the perfect, because the perfect should never be the enemy of the good. And I think it would be a good thing if Congress passed a mental health bill, if it were able to also include, you know, more gun safety, minimizing the large clip ammunition, all of the clamp down on the gun show loophole and all that stuff, yeah. But I'm not gonna make that a, a litmus test on whether I support a mental health bill passing. And I hope the Congress doesn't as it, uh, either. We have a lot of questions from our Town Hall Forum audience about children and helping children uh, with addictions but who don't acknowledge it. How, what advice do you give to parents with, whose children might be suffering from mental illness or addiction? Well, first of all, we need a checkup from the neck up. <laughs> In every single physician's visit that you have. 
whether it's a pediatrician who certainly ought to be doing this double time, given the early onset of these illnesses. Pediatricians need to be trained up and they need to have the wraparound services to help the families. All of that needs to be, we need to have our A game. But we also need checkup for the neck up for, you know, obstetricians. And we need to check up in the neck up for our geriatricians, because addiction's also skyrocketing, skyrocketing amongst our elderly. The point is, if we make mental health and addiction care normal, normal part of health care, then it won't seem like such a big deal, because you'll want to go in there, well, what's my lipid level? I mean, do I need to be on that cholesterol drug or not? Or how's I, how am I doing on this? I mean, wouldn't it be great if we were kind of having this conversation because we all wanted better mental health care? I mean, can you imagine, like, where we actually wanted to be healthier mentally? I mean, perish the thought, you know, that that as a nation, that that would be something that we would desire as consumers. Um, so we have to change the thing. We have to be all about producing healthier, mentally healthier children. And that means giving them coping skills, um, helping them deal with stress, toxic stress. All of those things ought to be embedded in our healthcare system. Um, and therefore, we wouldn't have to wait. Well, I wonder whether he's abusing his Adderall and, you know, or smoking too much marijuana or blah, blah, blah. You know, this should have been like, that conversation should have been before all of that. The Minnesota National Guard has the si highest suicide rate in the country. For veterans returning to the communities that sent them to war, what effect does the involvement of the whole community have on the health and recovery of veterans? Well, we could spend the next week talking about this, but I would just emphasize my previous point about making sure we audit insurance companies. And, and United ought to start with the name United. You know what no one realizes? 72% of all returning veterans will never darken the hall of a VA in their lifetime. Did any of you realize that? Didn't you think that all these veterans just went to the VA? Eh, not true. Because you know what? Most veterans are guard and reservists. You realize that our guard and reservists are over half the force we send to our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which means when they return, they return to their employer. And my point is, if their employer does not have employer-sponsored health care, that covers mental health and addiction, guess what's gonna happen to those veterans? They're not gonna get their signature wound of war treated by our medical system because insurance companies are denying mental health and addiction coverage at a higher rate than they would the rest of physical medicine. So my thing would be our Fortune 500 companies ought to beware because if they think the VA scandal was bad about veterans not being able to go see a physician, imagine when, when, when you know, JP Morgan or Walmart or FedEx or one of these companies that been good enough to hire all these veterans actually stumbles upon the fact that their employer-sponsored health care has a phantom network of mental health providers. So when those veterans in their course of employment need these services because they served all of us and can't get them, it's because we haven't properly enforced the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. So we need to do parity for our patriots. That would be my answer because we could all feel awful about the terrible plight of our veterans, but if we're not prepared to do something about that, then that's a lot of hot air and talk, and we should be over the hot air and talk with the number of our veterans that are dying every day because of the lack of attention to what their real needs are, and that is proper coverage in these areas. Talking about insurance companies, a lot of questions about how to deal with them. Insurance companies claim it would be too expensive to cover mental health to the degree that it needs to be. Your premiums would be too high. 
and you would not purchase that kind of policy. How can all this be overcome? How do we make a, a dent in the insurance company issue? Well, first and foremost, would they say that about cancer? They say, oh, well, you know, it costs me a lot of my insurance dollar to pay for diseases of cancer. Eh, that's expensive. No, I don't want to plan that. I'm not going to. You wouldn't think of it. But the real answer that shouldn't be the answer is that you should do this because of the cost savings. I know it would be great if we saved all these Americans from dying of overdose and from suicide, but you know what works in Washington, works in the private sector is just give me the dollars and cents, please. Tell me that it saves dollars and cents. And frankly, all the health economists will tell you the savings aren't if you spend a lot more, which is what we need to do in mental health and addiction care, not a lot more. We gotta build out a system that's non-existent. If we do that, it's gonna cost a lot of money, but you know where the return is? Lower comorbidity costs in the rest of medicine and healthcare. And that's a, that's a fact. <laughs> four times the rate. I have to quote Jim Ramstead all the time. Four times the rate if you have an untreated mental illness or addiction, the rest of their health care costs. So this is a, a, an easy calculation. It'll save, and of course, insurance has squeezed everything now. They've got to find where is the secret sauce that's going to allow me to hold premiums lower. You know what? Addressing all those things like irritable bowel and, you know, sore back and the contusions that you get because you're falling down the stairs and the lacerations you get because you stumble through this and that. And none of it is written up as a symptom of alcoholism and addiction. None of it. So you really want to know the true cost? You know, I'd ask IBM to partner with these insurance companies and really Google all of the true costs of untreated mental illness and addiction, and they're going to find our health care system is rife with cost of untreated mental illness and addiction, and no one calls it for what it really is. And uh, that's what we need to start doing. I think that's all we have time for. Thank you, Patrick Kennedy.